See, I'm not wearing my robe today. I hope you don't mind. But last week, I felt like I was going to pass out from the heat up here. So, so rather than passing out, I decided not to wear my robe. Um, our school supply drive uh, next Sunday, you still have time if you would like to bring some supplies in. And um, after the service, Christy's going to gather them all up and bring them down to the Moravian Church. So thank you all who contributed so far. And um, again, still have one more week. Are there any other announcements this morning? Nope. Okay, then let's just take a moment to quiet ourselves and center ourselves and open our hearts to the Holy Spirit. Amen. May grace and peace be yours in abundance in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. Please join me in our call to worship. Let us worship the eternal God, the source of love and life who creates us. Let us worship the Spirit, the holy fire who renews us. Let us lift our hearts together in our opening prayer. O oh God, our guide and guardian, you have led us apart from the busy world into the quiet of your house. Grant us grace to worship you in spirit and in truth, to the comfort, to, to the comfort of our souls and the upbuilding of every good purpose and holy desire. Enable us to do more perfectly the work to which you have called us, that we may not fear the coming of night, and we shall surrender into your hands the tasks which you have committed to us. So may we worship you not with our lips only at this hour, but in word and deed all the days of our lives. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Please rise if you are able as we sing our hymn of praise, which is in our balloon hymn, number 377, Joyful, Joyful, We Adore Thee. <laughs>
share this bread with all the world. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. We cannot come before God unless we are first honest with ourselves about who we are, about the mistakes we make, and about how well or poorly we care for others. In the spirit, let us offer our prayers to God. Great provider, we recognize that widespread hunger is no longer necessary. You have given us humans the resources to feed all people, yet we are selfish. While we overfill our bellies with food and lay to waste the spaces needed for crops to flourish, others are crying out for crumbs from our tables. Living God, cultivate within our hearts reckless generosity and plant within us spirits of simplicity and balance in body and soul. Though at times we fail to be generous, your generosity towards us is never ending. By sending Christ and the Spirit to your people, you have extended generosity beyond measure. Let us do the same. Amen. Now we will have the reading of our Holy Scriptures. We proclaim God's holy word. Our first reading today is 2 Kings 4, verses 42 through 44. A man came from Baal-Shalisha, bringing food from the first fruits to Elisha, the man of God. Twenty loaves of barley and fresh ears of grain in his sack. Elisha said, Give it to the people and let them eat. But his servant said, how can I set this before a hundred people? So he repeated, Give it to the people and let them eat. For thus says the Lord, They shall eat and have some left. He said it before them, They ate and had some left. According to the word of the Lord. Second reading is Psalm 145, verses 10 through 18. All your works shall praise you, O Lord, and your faithful ones shall bless you. They shall tell of the glory of your kingdom and speak of your power, that all people may know of your power and the glorious splendor of your kingdom. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. Your dominion endures throughout all ages. You, Lord, are faithful in all your words and loving in all your works. The Lord upholds all those who fall and lifts up those who are bound down. The eyes of all wait upon you, and you give them their food in due season. You open wide your hand and satisfy the desire of every living thing. You are righteous in all your ways, in loving in all your works. You are near to all who call upon you, to all who call upon you faithfully. Now our third reading this morning is from the for this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth takes its name. I pray that 
according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you that you may be strengthened in your inner being with power through the Spirit, and Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, and you are being rooted and grounded in love. I pray that you may have the power to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and the length, the height and the depth, and the number of love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, so that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now, to him who by the power at work within us is able to accomplish abundantly far more. Than all we can ask or imagine. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus through all generations, forever and ever. Amen. So, morning, our gospel lesson is found in the gospel according to John from chapter 6, verses 1 through 21. Listen for the word of God. Jesus went to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, also called the Sea of Tiberias. A large crowd kept following him because they saw the signs that he was going for the sick. Jesus went up the mountain and sat down there with his disciples. Now the Passover, the festival of the Jews, was near. When he looked up and saw a large crowd coming towards him, Jesus said to Philip, Where are we to buy bread for these people to eat? He said this to test him, for he himself knew what he was going to do. Philip answered him, Six months' wages would not buy enough bread for each of them to get a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, There is a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish. But what are they among so many people? Jesus said, Make the people sit down. Now there was a great deal of grass in the place, so they sat down about 5,000 in all. Then Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated, so also the fish, as much as they wanted. When they were satisfied, he told his disciples, gather up the fragments left over, so that nothing may be lost. So they gathered them up, and from the fragments of the barley, five barley loaves left by those who had eaten, they filled 12 baskets. When the people saw the sign that he had done this, they began to say, This is indeed the prophet who is to come into the world. And Jesus realized that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king. He withdrew again to the mountain by himself. When evening came, his disciples went down to the sea, got into a boat, started across the sea to Capernaum. It was now dark, and Jesus had not yet come to them. The sea became rough because a strong wind was blowing. When they had rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus walking on the sea and coming near the boat, and they were terrified. But he said to them, It is I, do not be afraid. Then they wanted to take him into the boat, and immediately the boat reached the land toward which they were going. And God had a blessing through this reading from God's holy word. We have been reading over the past few weeks from the Gospel according to Mark. And now over the next five weeks, we'll be switching to John, reading from <clears throat> all of chapter six. When we switch back and forth between Gospels, we need to be careful <clears throat> because we need to remember that each author was writing to a particular group of people and that each author had a particular agenda in mind, a message that they wanted to convey to that audience. And so for John, the message that John is teaching, teaching them and teaching us, is the power of God in Jesus and who this Jesus is. And we learn about who this Jesus is by what he does. That's often how we learn 
about who most people are by what they do. The words that Jesus uses in his discourses connect to the stories that we'll hear over these next five weeks. And these stories will show his signs, his amazing works, and connect it all to who Jesus is as God's son, as the great I am. Another thing that we have to keep in mind when we're switching around from gospel to gospel is that some of the stories appear in one or more of the gospels, and you'll notice sometimes they don't, based on, again, on what the author is trying to convey, what the author thinks is relevant at that time. But the story that we have for today, the feeding of the 5,000, this particular story is the only story, the only one of Jesus' miracle stories that's recorded in all four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So you have to, you have to imagine to yourself that this is a very important story. Important, otherwise it wouldn't be included in all. The multiplication of those five small loaves and two tiny fish that becomes a feast of thousands. When I was rereading the story this week, I began to think about how big that crowd was. Help me think about that because you know we we haven't been around crowds for a while. And now now the sporting events and things are just starting to to come back and you see these large stadiums and, and you see how many people are there, 5,000, 10,000, 20,000. So it gave me a little bit better perspective of what 5,000 people look like. And the thing about the 5,000 people is that in Matthew's gospel, Matthew said that there were 5,000 men there and he adds, and also women and children, which means it could have even been double the amount that are there. 5,000 plus people all on the hillside, all there for many reasons. And to make this situation a little harder, as I think about them all on the hillside, these 5,000 people there, some of them are just curious about who this Jesus is. Some of them have heard about the things that he has been doing. Some of them heard that he can heal, and so they're there for healing. As I think about them all on that side of the, the mountain, I think about it's not like being in a large mega church where you have all the amenities. And this crowd, this crowd that's there is a marginalized group. They are most likely tired and hungry. They they might even be a little a little bit on the irritating side, you know, it might be a little irritable. And most likely they're there not at this point motivated by faith and repentance or love for Jesus, but they're just figuring out who this Jesus is. Again, they may be there just out of curiosity, or they may be there out of desperation because they are sick or a family member is sick and they don't know what else to do. This crowd may at this point have failed to grasp the true significance of the miraculous signs that Jesus has been displaying. The signs that we know point unmistakably to who Jesus is. Jesus as the Son of God, the Messiah. So they flock in to see him. 
But at this point, they're not accepting of his words. They want the benefits of what he can do, but they're not sure that they're ready to follow him and grow in their spiritual lives. And so this sets the scene of where we are today. And the disciples are anxious, and I can imagine I would be anxious too if I were these disciples. And Jesus says, what are we going to do? We have this huge, hungry crowd, tired, maybe with short tempers, and marginalized people, people wanting power and freedom, people wanting a new king, a king that will take them out from under this tyrannical government that they've been living under. And so Jesus asked Philip this question, where do we buy bread so that these people may have something to eat? And Jesus, we hear, is not asking this, does he need an answer? He, he's asking this as a teaching moment. And Philip says that even six months' salary couldn't pay enough to feed even a little bit for even a, for the crowd to get each person to get a little bit. But Jesus is about to demonstrate as God in human flesh that he will provide for their every need, for our every need. And then Andrew stepped forward. He maybe thinks he might have some kind of solution. He said, there's a boy here with five barley loaves and two small fish. But then he asked, but what, but what are they for so many? So most of you probably don't understand the significance that John specifically says they are barley loaves. Because for us, barley is just another grain. In fact, I don't know about you, but I like barley. I especially like beef barley soup. But the food that this boy has is considered the poorest and worst kind. Barley is specifically prescribed in the Mishnah, which is a Jewish law book. That's the bread which is to be used by an adulteress when she makes an offering for her sin. Barley was the grain of the poorest and the despised. And in fact, it was considered only fit for animals. Those with any means at all would never ever consider eating loaves of barley bread. But that's what they have today. And so Jesus, and his asking of this question, what are we going to feed these people? He is bringing his disciples through this living parable. He's asking this careful question where they must confess to themselves that on their own, what they have is, is minuscule compared to the needs that they are faced with. And as I think about that, I think about those disciples looking out at this mass of people, I think about how many of us have felt and been in that same type of position or known someone who is been in that same type of position where the resources that we have are just a drop in the bucket compared to what we need. And it doesn't have to be just money or food. It can be things that affect our everyday lives. Things that we used to be able to do, but we can't do anymore. We need someone to help us, but we don't always have someone there. When I when I think about that example, I think about my mother, who laments to me quite often 
my mother all her life was a very active person. She didn't like to sit still, she liked to do, she would like to take care of her own house, do her own cooking, do everything. Her garden is upset her greatly that I don't take care of the outside as well as she would. But she can't do it anymore. Because with her age comes arthritis and it comes with the rolling walker and unbalance. And her needs are greater than her resources. Or I think about those of us that raise children that might have some type of disability, a learning disability, a physical disability, or maybe an addiction. <clears throat> and no matter what we do or how much we try, we just can't seem to find the resources to help with that, that situation, to make that situation better. And I think about this past year with COVID, and especially in the beginning, when we didn't know what was happening, and the hospitals were filling up, and we didn't have enough PPE or beds or ventilators or staff, the needs were greater than our resources. And so Jesus exposes this truth to the disciples. Not to hurt or be cruel, but to show us God's powers by recognizing our own limitations. God provides for our needs when we place our inadequacies in God's hand. The boy with the five barley loaves and the two small fish was the poorest of poor. By any standard we could imagine, he was considered completely insignificant. We're not even told his name, which is generally true in our scriptures with our marginalized folks. And what does he have to offer? He has barley bread made from grain, which usually fed to livestock, and two tiny fish. I can imagine he feels very insignificant. Sometimes I know the things I have to offer makes me feel very insignificant. But the boy who has so little gives what little he has to Jesus. What little he has, he gladly gives to Jesus, places it in God's hand, and God works miracles with it. And if we give to God whatever we have, no matter how small it is, our time, our talents, whatever resources we may have, no matter how minuscule they may seem, no matter how insignificant they may seem, God can take them and multiply them. And as I think about that, I think about that with our little church. Because sometimes we think we're too small to do great things. But if we offer up to God whatever it is we have to offer, no matter how small, God can multiply that gift. And who knows what can be accomplished? Jesus taught us about that. Remember when he talked about the widow at the temple? He was watching all these rich people putting their gifts in the offering box. And this poor widow comes up and she puts in two small copper coins, basically a penny. And he says, truly, I tell you, this poor widow has put in more than all of them, for they all contributed out of their abundance, but she, out of her poverty, put in all she had to live on. When we give out of our abundance, we are tempted to imagine that we have 
that we have enriched God. But God doesn't need our gifts. He is after our faith in his goodness. It is when we give out of our poverty, when it when it's when we give out of all that we have, even if it's a mere penny, then we realize that God is enriching us. The little boy gave up his food, probably all he had for who knows how long. Wasn't even fit for poor people to eat. But what happened? He ends up eating more than his fill. They all ended up eating more than their fill with plenty left over. This miracle story is not told to say that no one will ever be hungry, that no one will never be mean. Jesus multiplies the food and walks among the people, distributing the bread and the fish with his own hands. That's significant in this story. Because if you remember back to this story in the other Gospels, Jesus gives the bread and fish to the disciples and they distribute the elements. But in John's Gospel, Jesus walks out among the, the people and he gives them the bread and the fish. John's gospel shows us that Jesus walks in and among us, that we are not left alone, that we are not left to our own resources. Jesus is there with us. Jesus, who is the great I am, and when the crowd saw all that Jesus could do, they said, he is indeed the prophet who would come to save them. And what did they do? They tried to make them their earthly king. But that's not what was to happen. So Jesus goes away. Because the crowd at this point is missing the point. And that's what John's gospel attempts to teach us. And over the next five weeks, this will be reinforced to us who exactly Jesus is and how we see that through his deed of power. The fact that Jesus is the great I am, God's son, our savior, and through him, who knows what great things we can do even if we only have a couple of small fish and a few loaves of stale bread. Let us pray. God, thank you for sending Jesus to us. Thank you for giving us these scriptures and stories and ways for us to understand who Jesus is. We pray that we can open our heart to receive Jesus into our hearts and by our faith that we would not be afraid that no matter what we have that we would have the confidence to know that it is enough as long as we offer it to Jesus. Because in this way, you can do great things. And as you do great things through our work, our great prayer is that one day your kingdom would come right here on earth as it is in heaven. And we pray this for Christ's sake. Amen. So we do each week see our offering plates in the rear of the sanctuary. And if you're able, 
We ask that you leave your offering after the service. Jesus said, I came that they truly, that they may have life and have it abundantly. As we have been granted great abundance, let us offer up those blessings in God's name. Mm -hmm. together and our intercessory prayers of the people. Rooted in Christ and sustained by the Spirit, we offer our prayers for the church, the world, and all of creation. We pray for the church. Bless the ministries of our neighboring congregations. Empower churches throughout the world and encourage missionaries to accompany global neighbors. Kindle in us the spirit of collaboration, that all people may know your loving works. Hear us, O oh God, your mercy is great. We pray for creation. Send rain to land experiencing drought, and come to the aid of those enduring sweltering heat. Nurture wheat and barley crops grown for the nourishment of your people, and conserve aquatic habitats and fish populations. Hear us, O oh God, your mercy is great. We pray for those who govern. Cast out arrogance, selfishness, and corruption, 
and instruct those who lead to practice compassion and humility. Inspire them with a vision of the common good and a commitment to ensure that all who hunger are fed. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. We pray for those bowed down by heavy burdens, those who are unemployed or underemployed, those unable to find affordable housing, and those without health insurance. Console those who grieve and hear the cries of those who call to you for healing. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. We pray for this assembly. Deepen our resolve to use what we have to serve those in need. When we worry that we do not have enough resources for ministry, assure us of your abundance. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. Are there others that need, need to be lifted up today? I ask that you pray for the twins. We lift up Quinn and Lana. Yeah. He went to Hopkins this past week and saw an oncologist and talked with a surgeon. And they told him that they're not doing anything to help him uh, to return to Gettysburg and see treatment there, which I presume is um, chemo radiation. That's to start this week. And uh, Pastor Sean, I'd like to share this uh, with you within this morning service, you talked about barley. A dear friend of mine witnessed his sister and father with cancer, developing stage four cancer. And um, they tried the chemo and the radiation and it didn't work. And somehow they learned about barley green powder. And barley green pills. They started taking this barley green powder, and in time, the cancer went into it just went away, stayed away for 10 years till they, I guess, got to come to the But it, it made the difference. And he swears, he said, Please tell people this. It's amazing. So the barley really got home with me. Thank you, Matthew. We certainly lift up Quinn and Lana, Rocky, and all the family, all their loved ones. We ask that you hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. We lift up all those on our prayer list, all those who long to be with us but are unable for various reasons. We pray for those who are lonely, those who are depressed, those who are hungry. Those who are far without homes, those who have needs and hurts, and sufferings that they hold in the silence of their own hearts that we can't even imagine. We lift them up to you and ask that you hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. We give thanks for those who have died, and you sustain them through all their days. So dwell in our hearts that we may have the power to comprehend with all the saints the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge. Hear us, O oh God, your mercy is great. We lift these and all our prayers to you, O oh God, confident in the promise of your saving love, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Now together let us pray as Jesus has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, 
Enjoy the breath. Right. And now I ask you to stand as you're able as we sing our closing hymn, which is number 349, over a thousand pounds we sing. surpass all of our understanding be with you all now and always. Amen. Amen.